Radio Raheem here at Wild Card Boxing Gym in Hollywood with a man that uh, many of you may have missed over the past weeks, but we still get to see you every now and then, Larry Merchant. Uh, last time we were in this exact same spot, actually for this exact same fighter, but this time we're going into his second fight. I'd just like uh, to revisit his first fight for a moment. What the criticism was, and there's always criticism once a guy steps into the professional ranks, was that he would, he didn't settle down in there. He still kind of fought like an amateur. How did you see the fight? Well, uh, I understand that critique, um, but he didn't fight the way he fought as an amateur, which was as a boxer puncher. Um, he got himself into a brawl because he I was excited. Um, he wanted to please the fans, and he was in there against a tall, uh, tougher than expected, awkward kid from Mexico. Um, but in the in the heat of the moment, uh, instead of running, he wanted to have a fight. And that's the good news. <laughs> well, you've been around the game long enough to see a bunch of guys come up from the Olympics, from the streets, you know, from these gyms all over the world. This particular guy, obviously Zhao Shiming, who's who we're talking about, came up through the Olympics. He's got his first fight in his home country, and it's been reportedly that he's been paid uh, three hundred thousand dollars for that first fight. Do you think it may have been a case of too much, too soon? No. Um, incidentally, he's getting 500000 for this one. He's the headliner, six-rounder. Uh, the other guys are the, in the title fights are supporting him. Uh, look, he puts the asses in the seats, as we say. Um, no, I think that he's 32 years old now. Uh, he was an elite amateur. Um, it showed that he had the, the ambition and the dedication to stay on top for a long, long time. And now the question is, uh, having been programmed as an amateur fighter for so long, can he deprogram or reprogram to a more professional style and uh, do it in um, a short time span, you know, um, because he is uh, 32 years old now. If I could ask you about the business of boxing, uh, you've been with HBO uh, for eons, if you will, and we've seen a few different business models about how to keep boxing in the forefront building fighters and whatnot. This seems, this international uh, focus seems to be something new. I, I don't know if it's new in the history of boxing, but it's certainly new in the recent history where we've got fighters coming out into the professional ranks, like you say, 300,000 for their first one, 500 for the second one. Top rank has also signed a Japanese Olympian and they're crowding stadiums overseas. Do you think that this is a better way to go about building boxing in, in the sense internationally instead of focus on domestic stars look when um, people think about boxing they think about American boxing um, but it is a globalized sport we see more international players in baseball and hockey and basketball um, and if the fighters are good enough and exciting enough uh, that Americans want to see him. I can't see how that can hurt. It can only help boxing. Um, three big major price fights coming up in the fall. Um, uh, two of them involving Mexicans and Americans. Uh, another one involving a Filipino and an American. Um, they're going to generate I don't know, a billion dollars in business and so on. So um, <clears throat> that kind of model shows the television industry and shows young athletes, here's, this thing is still going. It may not be the mainstream sport it once was, but for the devotees, the, the, the real fans, the countries where it's still big, it's still big. In your experience, now calling fights overseas, having an experience with those fans and their excitement level, the crowds, would you say that the international crowds are bigger boxing fans now than even Americans? Look, um, there are different cultures and sometimes they appreciate different sides of the sport. Mexican fans want to see their guys get in there and battle. Um, Filipino fans love that also. Some 
uh, European countries, uh, they may appreciate the uh, finer arts of boxing a little bit more. But at the end of the day, uh, prize fighting is an international language and uh, it may have different dialects, but um, it, speaks, it still speaks to people. Well, let's speak a little bit about that international language when it comes to the Philippines and uh, East LA by way of Mexico. We've got a huge fight for top rank coming up in November. It's going to be Manny Pacquiao and Brandon Rios. You know, last time you and I spoke, we didn't know what was next for Pacquiao. Now we do. How do you size that fight up? Well, Rios is uh, <clears throat> the kind of tough, non-stop fighter um, who is what I think of as a truth teller. He'll find the truth in the opponent. Uh, if the opponent is not in 100% shape, uh, we'll find that out. If uh, Manny Pacquiao um, doesn't have the ability to still live the life of the fighter, the dedication required because he's got another full-time job, we'll find that out. Another telling aspect of where a warrior is and his longevity as a warrior in the ring is after his first big loss. A, a knockout like Manny Pacquiao suffered may be uh, more challenging even than a career in politics. Seeing so many fighters throughout the ages, how does a fighter like Pacquiao respond to a knockout like that? Look, there have been fighters who've come back uh, not just from knockouts, from, but from bad beatings, um, and not, you know, some of them become gun shy. Um, they don't want to get hit like that anymore. Um, that's one of the tests that Pacquiao is going to have to pass to uh, show himself as the rest of the world whether he still wants to be uh, the kind of rare fighter he was for a decade. You know, with a Brandon Rios uh, a type of opponent, it's a wonder whether or not that was the wisest choice for Pacquiao, being that, like you said, some guys get gun shy. Uh, a lot of people thought that maybe Pacquiao would take a fight to kind of get his bearings back and then go in, you know, against heavy fire. Do you think it was wise to take on a challenge like Brandon Rios, who would otherwise be the perfect style for him, except he's coming off such a vicious knockout. Brandon Rios is going to do one thing and come forward. If, if you were a young fighter, you would say you got to give him time to restore himself, rebuild his confidence, show the public that he's still getting after it. But um, at this stage, um, to generate the kind of interest and uh, money that he has, I think this is a good choice. You know, uh, Either you do it, and we want to see you again, and see you as uh, Manny Pacquiao, or if you can't do it anymore, you had a great career. Turning to someone who may have been one of your opponents if you were 20 years younger. <laughs> 50. 50 years younger. Floyd Mayweather has also uh, signed up for what appears to be quite a challenge uh, at this stage of his career. Do you think Canelo Alvarez is the toughest fight out there for uh, Floyd Mayweather right now? I do. Um, and with uh, many other people in boxing, um, I didn't expect Mayweather to take this challenge on right now. That's not been his history, but um, I'm glad he has. And um, I think uh, Canelo is uh, a serious young fighter and um, I give him a, a chance. It's been said with Mayweather's bravado his whole career, he has defined through his uh, unanimous victory, uh, you know, no knock, no uh, losses, no defeats. That's how he defines himself. If he were to take a loss, either by knockout or by decision, does that, does the shine come off the apple? Is that the end of Mayweather right then and there? You know, it depends how the fight goes. Um, Roy Jones got knocked out with one punch after a sensational career and then got beaten up in his next fight. Uh, but he was still Roy Jones for a long time. And people remember that. Um, so it depends on how you go out to a certain degree, but it's what you do in your prime. Uh, Joe Calzaghe retired unbeaten. 
He beat Bernard Hopkins. He beat Roy Jones. He beat the best they had at the time. Um, I, I, I think that um, people have respect and admiration for Calzaghe as a hell of a fighter. But uh, if he'd have lost the decision somewhere along the way, I personally would have just as much respect. Um, that he could walk away from it while he was still on top, uh, good for you. Uh, Mayweather has been brilliant in marketing himself in different ways, one of them being that he's unbeaten and unbeatable. And um, uh, maybe so, maybe if he does get beaten, um, it impacts him more than others. But uh, I'm sure the first words out of his mouth was, you all said the greatest fighters in the world were beaten. I'm one of the greatest fighters in the world, and I just got beaten by a great young fighter. And that would be true. <laughs> well, <laughs> that leads me right into my next question. If he is successful in what he uh, aspires to, which he says is 49-0, and 0, the next five fights he retires undefeated, does he have a claim on greatest of all time? You know, I... Uh, <laughs> He can make whatever claim he wants. Um, Leonard, um, Marvin Hagel once said in the ring about how great he was, and I said to him, that's for others to decide. Larry, it's always a pleasure. I learn something every time. Once again, Radio Rahim with none other than Larry Merchant.